Tonight, tracking twin crashes, the emergency responses in the Northwest Territories and British Columbia. A deadly incident involving a passenger plane. The community is grieving. And in B.C., a helicopter ski expedition turns tragic. Ottawa defends its decision after a federal court finds using the Emergencies Act against the convoy protests was unjustified. The public safety of Canadians was under threat. Also, Donald Trump clinches another victory in New Hampshire. Plus, the Prime Minister's new plan to work with whoever wins the White House. And Canadians nab Oscar nominations. I started screaming and crying at the same time. The stunning surprises and stars snubbed. CTV National News with Omar Sachedina. Good evening, everyone. We are watching developments in two deadly air disasters tonight. Investigators from the Transportation Safety Board have been called to the sites of a helicopter accident in British Columbia that killed three people and also where a plane went down in the Northwest Territories this morning. We have confirmation people died in that crash, too. Mining giant Rio Tinto says the plane was taking its people to its Divic diamond mine. More now from CTV's Jill Makishan. Jill. Omar, the community of Fort Smith Northwest Territories is in mourning tonight with reports as many as 10 people are dead. Emergency crews rushed to Fort Smith's airport before 9 a.m. after a plane crashed near the Slave River. The British aerospace jet stream owned by Northwestern Air Lease is one of the larger planes in the company's fleet. It can hold up to 19 people. No information was provided on how many passengers were on board. RCMP, the Canadian Forces and the Canadian Rangers provided air support and search teams worked on the ground at the crash scene. The health centre declared a mass casualty event. This is the second plane crash in the Northwest Territories in less than a month. In late December, search and rescue teams found 10 people alive after an Air Tindy flight crashed near the Diavik diamond mine. Tonight, the Premier released a statement. The impact of this incident is felt across the territory. The people we lost were not just passengers on a flight. They were neighbours, colleagues, friends and loved ones. Their stories and contributions to our communities will not be forgotten. The Transportation Safety Board has deployed a team of investigators to the site and the coroner's office is expected to release more information tomorrow. Omar. All right, Jill, thanks. We are also learning more tonight about that other deadly air accident in B.C.'s backcountry. Three people were killed, four others are in hospital. And as CTV's Alison Bamford explains, the grief is extending well beyond Canada's borders. Industry experts are calling it a rare heliskiing incident, a fatal crash in the backcountry of West Central BC, leaving a community devastated. It's a tough loss in the community, you know, there's people that work in, in our town that, that work for this company and I think really hard on them and I, you know, our, our hearts bleed for those folks. The helicopter went down about 50 kilometres northwest of Terrace shortly after 4 p.m. Monday afternoon. It was one of three choppers on excursions for Northern Escape heliskiing. The company says the guests were experienced skiers but had never heliskied with them before. When you're flying in the mountains, weather is always something that you have to, to take into consideration and our pilots are very professional and, and do so. At this time, we, we can't forecast what was the cause of the accident. Italian media are reporting at least two of the three killed were from Italy. In a statement, Italy's foreign affairs minister says he joins in the pain of the families who lost their loved ones and has instructed the consulate to provide maximum assistance to the injured. BC's coroner's service and the Transportation Safety Board are leading the investigation to determine the cause. They'll examine uh, the maintenance records, make sure that uh, maintenance was being uh, conducted and there were no, uh, no faults uh, when it was dispatched. The crash site is only accessible by helicopter. Mounties and coroners were expected to fly out to assess the site today. The Transportation Safety Board says it has plans to deploy its own team of investigators. Omar? Alison Benford on the fatal crash near Terrace, B.C. tonight. 
The federal court ruled today that Ottawa's unprecedented use of the Emergencies Act to shut down the so-called Freedom Convoy protest two years ago was not justified. The legal decision coming a year after a public inquiry concluded the federal government did meet the threshold. CTV's Annie Bergeron-Oliver on the reaction and next steps. The federal government is under fresh scrutiny after the federal court ruled its use of the Emergencies Act was not necessary. In a 190-page report, Justice Robert Mosley wrote, the decision to issue the proclamation does not bear the hallmarks of reasonableness and was not justified. What the federal court said today is, use of the Emergencies Act, not right, not reasonable, the orders that were passed, not constitutional. The government is issuing an order with immediate effect. Ottawa invoked the Emergencies Act in February 2022 to clear the convoy protest against vaccine mandates. Civil liberties groups argued the act and subsequent orders, including the freezing of protesters' bank accounts, was a charter infringement. Justice Mosley agreed. The scope of the regulations was overbroad in so far as it captured people who simply wanted to join in the protest by standing on Parliament Hill carrying a placard. Anywhere we go from here, this sets a legal precedent. It does make the government vulnerable for people seeking damages now who have had their uh, charter rights infringed per this ruling of the, of the federal court. Last year, the public inquiry into the use of the Emergencies Act found with reluctance that the high threshold to invoke the act was met. The prime minister, who was among dozens to testify, was adamant the act ended the protest. I am absolutely, absolutely serene and confident um, that I made the right choice. The federal court agreed. disagrees. The record does not support a conclusion that the convoy had created a critical, urgent and temporary situation that was national in scope and could not effectively be dealt with under any other law in Canada. The Liberal cabinet is standing behind its decision, arguing that at the time, the public safety of Canadians and Canada's national security was under threat. I was certain at the time. I was certain when I testified before Rouleau and I remain certain today. The deputy prime minister disagrees with the court's decision and says Ottawa Omar intends to appeal. All right, Annie, thank you. Well, in the appeal for votes in New Hampshire, Donald Trump scored a victory in that state's Republican primary tonight. Well, I want to thank everybody. This is a fantastic state. This is a great, great state. You know, we won New Hampshire three times now, three. If we don't win, I think our country is finished. And joining us from Manchester again tonight is CTV's Washington Bureau Chief Joy Melvin. And Joy, tonight's result throws into question Nikki Haley's political future, but Trump's opponent didn't sound like she was backing down. Uh, no, in fact, Donald Trump had really hoped for a knockout blow tonight. Instead, Nikki Haley upstaged him. Uh, she said she is, is still in this race. She's not backing down. She challenged Donald Trump to a debate, even knocked his age, continuing her criticism. Um, as for Donald Trump, well, um, tonight he, uh, he criticized her, called her delusional and a sore loser. Uh, more of Donald Trump, so get ready for the next race. And in a few weeks, that race turns to Haley's home state of South Carolina, where she's been twice elected governor, but currently is trailing Trump. What does she need to do, Joy, to be competitive? Uh, Omar, she needs money and she needs wins. The Nevada caucus is pretty much uh, sewn up for Donald Trump. Uh, and South Carolina, even though she was the governor for two terms there, it's now pretty much Trump country. In fact, every top Republican official there has endorsed Trump, even those who used to condemn him for the 91 criminal charges that he faces over the insurrection at the Capitol attack on January 6th. Omar? All right, Joy, thank you for this tonight. The Prime Minister said today another Trump presidency could signal more volatility for Canada. A key reason the Liberals have struck a team to go on offense before November's U.S. presidential election. Here's CTV's Kevin Gallagher. The potential impact of this year's U.S. election has the Prime Minister and his cabinet taking precautions. Obviously, uh, Mr. Trump uh, represents a certain amount of, uh, of unpredictability. Justin has agreed to cut all tariffs <laughs> and all trade barriers. As president, Donald Trump often clashed with Canada over trade. Canada-U.S. relations, I mean, from the backbone of so many industries, 
And as the junior partner or the smaller partner in a lot of those, I think we feel things a lot more deeply. Today, Justin Trudeau appointed a team to influence American mayors, governors, senators and business leaders on the importance of Canadian trade, similar to the Team Canada strategy used to renegotiate NAFTA. Because ultimately, not all decisions are made by the president and the administration. Canada's ambassador to the U.S., Kirsten Hillman, will lead a new effort before the U.S. election, along with International Trade Minister Mary Ng, Industry Minister Francois-Philippe Champagne, and Auto Parts Manufacturers Association CEO Flavio Volpe. Whether it's Trump or Biden, uh, you know, we always are ready to turn around and show everybody that the American interest is in large part the Canadian interest. Trade tensions are always possible whether there's a Democrat or a Republican in the White House, with NAFTA up for mandatory review in the next two years. Omar? All right, Kevin, thank you. The NDP leader has gathered his caucus in Edmonton for three days to plot out his priorities before the House of Commons resumes next week. We've seen a lot of frustration, a lot of worry and anxiety, and we want to find ways to make that better. And what we know that people are worried about, cost of groceries, cost of rent, cost of housing, cost of mortgage. The party that has an agreement with the Liberals is discussing how to push the government on its legislative agenda, like the delayed Pharmacare bill. And not far from the NDP retreat, terrifying moments when a heavily armed gunman opened fire inside Edmonton City Hall. The suspect entered City Hall through the parkade. He then proceeded through City Hall with a firearm firing multiple shots and shattering glass within the building. Police say he also threw a Molotov cocktail, causing a fire in an elevator. No one was injured. So let's have that conversation, right? And yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, follow, up, follow up on it off, uh, offline. Gunshots interrupting the mayor who was in the building, holding an emergency management meeting. I heard a few bangs, thought maybe it was... Um, setting up an event or something going on in the city room. An unarmed security guard was the one to initially detain the suspect. And within minutes, officers took him into custody. I'm proud that Edmonton City Hall has been an open and welcoming space for decades. And I'm confident that it will continue to be. Elementary school students at City Hall for a field trip were immediately evacuated. Police are investigating the suspect's motive and belief that he acted alone. And legal arguments resumed today on whether the murder of a Muslim family in London, Ontario, amounted to terrorism. I think it was a killing, it was a murder, it was a homicide, but it was not a terrorist act. And uh, it's important to, to litigate this because there's so little law surrounding the issue of terrorism in Canada. 23-year-old Nathaniel Veltman was found guilty last year for driving his truck into the Afzal family, killing four of them in 2021. The Crown argued in court that Veltman was motivated by ideology. Coming up, the deadliest day for Israeli troops since the war began. Soldiers laid to rest as hostage deal negotiations continue. Plus, Canadians score Oscar nominations. Israel is mourning the loss of 24 of its soldiers killed in the deadliest day for the country's forces since the war against Hamas began. CTV's Heather Wright on the mounting death toll on both sides of the conflict. A soldier is laid to rest in Tel Aviv this morning, one of 24 killed in combat yesterday, the deadliest day for Israeli troops since the war began. According to Al Jazeera, the smoke rising in this video is from where the deadly explosion took place. The Israeli military says soldiers had laid out explosives in a building which was hit by an RPG and collapsed. <laughs> Despite the heavy losses, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has vowed to keep fighting as negotiations for a truce and the release of hostages continue behind the scenes. We are getting uh, a constant stream of uh, replies from both sides and that 
that in its own right is, is a cause for optimism. Qatar remains at the center of those talks, as does the United States, though neither would comment on reports that Israel had offered a two-month ceasefire in exchange for the release of all hostages. I, I can't give you odds on, on, on if and when we'll be able to get there, but the conversations are very sober and serious about trying to get another hostage deal in place. In Gaza, the Palestinian Health Authority says the death toll has now risen past 25,000. The UN says the majority of those killed have been women and children. We went to check on our home, says Ahed Masma, and found bodies scattered around. He helped transport the dead on his donkey cart to this hospital in Khan Yunus. And while more aid is getting into Gaza, the World Food Program says it's nearly impossible to get aid to some areas because of the destruction and ongoing fighting. On Monday, the United States and Britain carried out large-scale military strikes on eight sites in Yemen, controlled by Houthi militants. Strikes aided, in part, by Canada. The Iran-backed Houthis have vowed to keep attacking ships as a protest to the Israel-Hamas war, saying they will retaliate against these latest strikes. Omar. All right, Heather, thank you. Sweden is one step closer to joining NATO after Turkish lawmakers approved its membership today. That leaves Hungary as the only country standing in the way of Sweden's bid to join the military alliance, a bid that was launched after Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And no end in sight as the war approaches its second anniversary next month. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky says 18 people were killed and more than 130 injured in the latest barrage of Russian rockets on the capital, Kyiv, as well as on cities in the east and the south. The wounds of war are not always visible. Coming up. I have PTSD. Canadian veterans take on a new fight. We are taking a closer look tonight at a growing global problem that also affects millions of Canadians. In fact, half of all people struggling with mental health don't get the help they need. And each day, more than 200 people in this country will attempt suicide. Veterans are often among those trying to find support. CTV's Heather Butts on a shared journey of trauma and recovery. Uh, this was presented to me after, uh, after a tour. Chris Dupuy is proud of his service with the Canadian military, including a deployment to Afghanistan. Unexpected, perhaps, when that very career led him down a path of mental illness. There's a lot coming at you. Dupuy was later diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder, leading to his release from the military. Over the years, he's gone from living in his truck and avoiding PTSD triggers to speaking openly about his mental health. It's a mirror, right? We gotta, we gotta look into it and we gotta recognize what we see as ours, like, okay, I have PTSD, now what? Struggling to find the right support, Dupuy realized a way of helping himself was to help others. That led to the creation of Cadence, a mental health treatment center for veterans and first responders. It's a very cozy and comforting space here. At the entrance, inspiring words from people who have walked this path of recovery, helping to guide those who will follow. They offer professional support focused on frontline trauma. A common theme for those on a shared journey of pain and recovery. David Ward is one of them. I ended up falling into a deep rut and I attempted suicide with a firearm. Ward had served 19 years with two tours in Afghanistan. And I realized that the moment that I felt that bullet go through my forehead was I, I was looking at the world wrong because at that point in time I had lost hope. Getting help in a space surrounded by other veterans gives him the strength to share his story. I don't want people to follow the same footsteps. I'm hoping that with my openness and my struggles and being open with that, hopefully people can relate and not go down the same path. Here, it's about helping that community through shared conversation. It starts with actually, I believe, an acknowledgement of, of what you're going through. You really got to see that, you know, talking helps you uh, get to that point. Dupuy admits managing mental health will be a lifelong journey, one he believes should not be done alone. Heather Butts, CTV News, Newmarket, Ontario.
And if you or someone you know is in crisis, call or text the National Suicide Crisis Hotline at 988. Canada Post is paying tribute to Mary Ann Shad, the abolitionist, educator, and lawyer. She's being honored with a stamp ahead of Black History Month in February. Born in Delaware in 1823, Shad taught in Windsor, Ontario in 1851, where she helped open a school that supported families fleeing slavery. She later became the first black woman in North America to publish and edit a newspaper. As we think about her legacy today, we should remember the words of a young 26-year-old Marianne Shad. We should do more and talk less. Shad's father, Abraham, who was active in the Underground Railroad, was featured on the first Black History Month stamp issue 15 years ago. And from one Canadian notable to a few others, the homegrown talent nominated for Hollywood's top prize. The countdown to Hollywood's biggest awards night has begun. The Oscar nominees were revealed today, and there was a strong Canadian contingent. CTV's Vanessa Lee with the roundup. Canadian Ryan Gosling has earned his third trip to the Oscars. Can I need a clicky pen? No. This time for Best Supporting Actor. You really did it. This Ottawa talent agent first met Gosling when he was nine. I told people in Cornwall back then when I first when he first performed, I said he's not going to be in Cornwall for long. This kid is going places. Ken is up for an Academy Award, but not Barbie. Margot Robbie was snubbed along with Greta Gerwig, despite directing the highest grossing movie last year. It was like a, a truly unbelievable moment. Quebec director Vincent René Lortie's Invincible is nominated for Best Live Action Short Film. It's based on the story of his childhood friend who died tragically at the age of 14 after driving a stolen car into a river. The fact that there's a lot of teenagers and kids that are sometimes struggling a lot with mental health and it's important to talk about that. Korean-Canadian Celine Song's romantic drama Past Lives is in the running for Best Picture and Best Original Screenplay. Yeah! This is the team from the short documentary film The Last Repair Shop celebrating their Oscar nod this morning. The third Academy Award nomination in four years for director Ben Proudfoot of Halifax. Music and arts education needs an advocate. Um, if we're silent about it, it goes away. It gets cut. Legendary Toronto musician Robbie Robertson has earned a posthumous Oscar nomination for Best Original Score for Killers of the Flower Moon. Oppenheimer leads the pack with 13 nominations, including Best Picture. The Oscars will be handed out on March 10th. Vanessa Lee, CTV News, Montreal. And that is a snapshot of this Tuesday. For all of us at CTV National News, thank you for watching. Good night and see you tomorrow. She had gone through so much, it just didn't seem fair. A Canadian icon's heartbreaking health crisis. Stiff person syndrome. W5 dispels the myths. It's a disorder that takes over your life. All new, next Saturday at 7 on CTV. Canadians have turned to CTV National News for more than 60 years. And now there's a new national newscast at 5.30. It's more of the news you trust. More of the experience you rely on. Watch Canada's number one national news now at 5.30 and 11.